gunman opens fire on a Long Island railroad car packed with commuters. Everybody's running crazy. I see blood all over. The nation is transfixed when the accused shooter acts as his own attorney. This is a case of stereotype victimization of a black man. Are these the words of a madman or a calculating killer's finest performance? He had cast himself in a leading role, which nobody had anticipated. On December 7th, 1993, Robert Giuliano is on his daily commute home from work in New York City to Long Island. Got on the train, headed out of Penn Station on the 533 to uh, Mineola, which I take to Maryland Avenue. 14 years I had a business in the city and that was my car. Third car, third seat. You met the same people every night. I may not have known them intimately or personally, because you know what? Everybody had their place, and it was nice. Until it was disrupted. We got to Jamaica Station. And uh, I remember this woman, young, young girl came on. Beautiful, angelic face, very pretty girl. He said, is this seat taken? I said, no. Started going. The train pulls out of Jamaica Station and heads towards Mineola. We get to New Hyde Park, and at that point I get up, I have a briefcase, and I wait by the door for the next stop. As soon as the door closes, I hear shooting. In a, in a maze. Is this a movie? I'm looking down this. I see blood all over. Everybody's running crazy. Over the next three minutes, the man shoots 25 people. Robert Giuliano is one of them. They go and I went like this. One went over my head, and one went through my arm into my chest. I didn't know I was shot. I didn't feel a pain, I didn't feel a sting, nothing like that. I looked around and thought I was being tackled. There was nobody there. At that point, it got quiet. There was no more shooting. And I started gasping for air. I couldn't breathe. And at that point, that's when they jumped him. Paramedics and police rush to the Maryland Avenue station. Meanwhile, 47-year-old Joyce Gorecki is expecting her husband, James, to arrive home from work at any moment. But that night, he's late. He was like an angel. Everybody loved him. He was just one of the nicest people you could ever meet. My neighbor told my daughter that there was a shooting at the station in Garden City. So I really was getting very worried. So around 10.30, the doorbell rang. I opened the door, and the two detectives were there. And I said, he got killed, didn't he? And they said, yes. And with that, I, um, I fell to the floor. James Gorecki, two other men, and two young women were dead. Another young woman died at the hospital soon afterward. She was the sixth victim. Nineteen others were wounded. For the survivors, this would be just the beginning of their ordeal. The man who passengers had tackled is 35-year-old Colin Ferguson. 
a well-educated immigrant from a wealthy Jamaican family. He had been caught, literally, with a smoking gun. In his pockets, police find handwritten notes entitled, Reasons for This, which suggests the attack was racially motivated. At first glance, it looks like an open and shut case. Despite everything, Ferguson claims an unidentified white man was the real killer and that he had escaped. With a train full of witnesses, Ferguson is clearly delusional or a liar. He insists he is perfectly sane, but his court-appointed attorney thinks differently. He announces that despite Ferguson's claims, he will pursue a verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity. But Ferguson rejects the plea and refuses to cooperate. Instead, he talks to leading civil rights attorney, Ronald Cuby, who has a track record of successfully defending difficult cases. We didn't claim that Colin was sane, but the form the insanity took was what we deem to be black rage. Colin Ferguson stands accused of being the sole trigger man in a hate-fueled shooting spree on the Long Island Railroad. Rejecting an insanity plea by his court-appointed attorneys, Ferguson seeks out leading civil rights attorney, Ronald Cuby. We had uh, just been following the case in the media, and then after a month or two had gone by, and there had been much more explication about racism and about Colin Ferguson's claims of racism, statements about race, his specific stated desire to kill white people. It was at that point that he contacted our office. QB and his partner, William Kunstler, agree to take Ferguson's case and begin to formulate their defense. Although they agree with Ferguson's public defender that their client is insane, they take a different approach, one that is grounded in Ferguson's past. Colin Ferguson was born in Jamaica, the son of a wealthy businessman. He graduated from high school in the top third of his class. In his early 20s, he moved to the U.S., but found he was only offered menial jobs. He began to feel a burning sense of injustice. For the first time, he began to encounter systematic institutionalized racism in the United States. Didn't encounter it in Jamaica. Had grown up thinking that, that he was no different uh, than anybody else and, and soon got to the United States and, and learned differently. Over the years, Ferguson gradually slid deeper into paranoia, becoming convinced that the world was conspiring against him. In the notes found on Ferguson, his rants about his sense of racial injustice gave QB and Kunstler their strategy for his defense. We didn't claim that Colin was sane. We were claiming that because of his delusional, paranoid state, he was not criminally responsible. He was not guilty by reason of insanity. But the form the insanity took was what we deem to be black rage. Initially, Ferguson is supportive of QB's black rage defense, even though it relies on the assumption that he is guilty and insane. In the meantime, prosecutor George Peck prepares to argue the opposite, that at the time of the shooting, Ferguson was not criminally insane. To prove it, he must demonstrate that Ferguson knew what he was doing and that he knew what he was doing was wrong. For Peck's prosecution, Ferguson's notes are equally important as they suggest he had carefully planned the attack. They also clearly explain that he didn't choose New York City as the venue due to Ferguson's respect for David Dinkins, New York's first black mayor. Ferguson had sat on the train and waited until they crossed into Nassau County before he opened fire. This is obviously an indication by Ferguson that he doesn't want to embarrass Dinkins. And if you don't want to embarrass someone, you know what you're doing is wrong. The stage is set for a trial that will ask whether Ferguson was driven mad by racial discrimination to the point
point that he was not responsible for his actions, or was he a calculating killer? But five months after choosing QB as his lawyer, Ferguson rejects the black rage defense. He again insists he is innocent and then accuses his own counsel of being part of the conspiracy against him. QB remains convinced Ferguson is insane, too crazy even to recognize that insanity is his only real defense. The craziest people in the world uh, are the ones who insist that there's nothing wrong with them. It's everybody else who has the problem. And Colin was very, very much in that category.